Dr. Fink, once again, we appreciate so much the opportunity to share some questions with you. Uh, many of our attendees have given us questions they'd like for you to uh, share a thought or an answer to. So I'm just going to read those and, okay. and let you let you fire away. First, uh, can PLS be passed down to children? Uh, the question about primary lateral sclerosis and whether or not it is inherited, and if it is inherited, is it always inherited? And when it is inherited, can it be transmitted to the next generation? Uh, the, the generalization is this. In general, it is extremely rare for primary lateral sclerosis to occur in families. Another way of saying that, it is extremely rare that if a person has primary lateral sclerosis, it's extremely rare for their siblings to be affected or their children to be affected. That's extremely rare. So the short answer is that uh, the chance that a person with primary lateral sclerosis would pass this to their children is extremely rare. I'm aware of one or maybe two families reported in the world in whom they had primary lateral sclerosis passed from one generation to another. So yes, on a scientific basis, strictly speaking, it has occurred, but in practical terms, that's extremely rare. And uh, uh, so I would, would say, uh, you can never say never, but I would say it's extremely unlikely that a person with primary lateral sclerosis would pass it on to their children. It seems like quite a few folks who have HSP and or PLS also have ehler danos syndrome or POTS or spasmodic dysphonia. Uh, are those related? Is there a reason that that happens? So the question about whether hereditary spastic paraplegia or primary lateral sclerosis can be associated with other neurologic conditions or non-neurologic conditions is something we're learning about. And uh, you mentioned uh, uh, three conditions, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, spasmodic dysphonia, and POTS syndrome. And uh, at this time, 2019, we would think that those conditions are probably not manifestations of hereditary spastic paraplegia, but are probably separate conditions. But this is, uh, we have to keep an open mind about this. Um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is a group of conditions, not one condition. There are a number of different types of Ehlers-Danlos uh, syndrome. And in some of those conditions, there is ex there's joint hypermobility, increased mobility of the skin, of the joints, of the connective tissue uh, around the arteries and so forth. And in general, that is not a feature that we see in other types in general of hereditary spastic paraplegia. Now, but there are exceptions. And some people have, have symptoms of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and POTS, P-O-T-S, postural um, uh, orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, is uh, seen in uh, Ehlers-Danlos type 3. And, eat, and POTS is actually itself a diverse group of conditions. It's not all one condition. And uh, so POTS is diverse. POTS can be seen in one form of Ehlers-Danlos. Ehlers-Danlos itself is diverse. But in general, our understanding is that uh, today is that um, uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and POTS specifically is not considered a part of the hereditary spastic paraplegias. But I want to diverge from this for just a second because in POTS specifically, it can affect, it is a symptom that, uh, of the autonomic nervous system disturbance in, uh, in, in regulating the pulse and blood pressure. And some forms of hereditary spastic paraplegia involve the peripheral nervous system and can involve the autonomic nervous system. And so, you can have symptoms of autonomic nervous system involvement in some forms of hereditary spastic paraplegia, and those symptoms can be similar to POTS syndrome. So the, the short answer to your question is that at this moment, we think that POTS syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and spasmodic dysphonia 
are not part of symptoms that are uh, common to uh, the most forms of hereditary spastic paraplegia and would be seen as probably separate conditions. Let me ask you two questions together. I think they are probably related. Is neuromuscular electrical stimulation safe? And would it be beneficial for individuals with HSP or PLS? And is neurofeedback treatment helpful or harmful to SPG4 individuals? Uh, neuromuscular stimulation with electrical stimulation uh, has its place in, uh, as a therapy to increase mobility and uh, in, in, in individuals where there's profound weakness. And so, for example, some people have used electrical stimulation in the face when there's been a facial nerve problem, not from hereditary spastic paraplegia or primary lateral sclerosis, but from something like Bell's palsy. So when, in order to just get the muscles moving, to have the muscles contracting, is uh, been uh, explored as a, bene as a therapeutic uh, approach. So similarly, when there's profound weakness from a, uh, a, neur a, a lower motor neuron or a neuropathy uh, problem, then uh, the electrical, direct electrical stimulation of the muscles is an approach that's taken for profound weakness when there's a, ner a peripheral nerve problem or a lower motor neuron problem that is explored. <clears throat> In general, most forms of hereditary spastic paraplegia don't have that kind of degree of lower motor neuron involvement and that kind of profound um, absence of peripheral movement. And so it's usually not performed for PLS or HSP. However, I know of two people with, uh, that is two people out of hundreds of people with uh, uh, forms of hereditary spastic paraplegia that have profound weakness and in those individuals direct muscle uh, stimulation does seem to show some benefit. Does progression of HSP, uh, SPG4 affect cognition? This is an important question about uh, whether or not cognition is affected in HSP and in SPG4 specifically and in primary lateral sclerosis by extension. And the answer is it can be. Cognition intelligence, thinking, decision-making, understanding, memory can be affected. And there are a number of papers that have shown this. So the answer is yes, it can be affected. Now, it's a big question because HSP is a big group of conditions. But uh, in some forms of HSP, cognition is typically or often affected. Uh, SPG 11, not in every person, but often it does affect intelligence. Eventually, it, it causes dementia uh, in many people. And there are many other forms of HSP that are associated with intellectual disability in early childhood. And uh, that is not progressive, just intellectual disability. And other forms of HSP are associated with dementia. So in some types of HSP, cognitive impairment is a major feature. But your question is about SPG4, the most common dominant form of HSP. Is it associated with dementia? And the answer is it can be. When studies have been done, the, the dementia is a, is, a, is, a, is a term meaning progressive loss of multiple cognitive functions. Memory is one cognitive function. Judgment, uh, decision making, uh, language, calculations, these are all different cognitive functions. And uh, in, in the pattern of cognitive, uh, the, the, when studies have been done, there have been different patterns of cognitive impact uh, in uh, SPG4. And it was very similar to the cognitive impact uh, shown in, in, uh, in ALS, because ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, can also have cognitive impairment. Not in everybody, but in some people. And some of the, Neuro, uh, uh, some of the studies of cognitive uh, loss in SPG4 showed results that were similar to the kind of cognitive impairment in ALS, meaning that these two motor neuron disorders, when cognition was affected, tended to have similar kinds of 
of uh, it, uh, patterns of impairment. Someone says, I have SPG4. My umbilical cord blood has been stored after the birth of my younger son. He has not been tested, nor has any symptoms of HSP at this point. Is there, are there any benefits to continue storing the, this umbilical cord blood? I think, uh, I think the, um, this is a difficult question about the benefits of storing umbilical cord blood. I think those benefits are, uh, are unknown and uh, theoretical. And I can't say that they are of no benefit. I won't say that. I think it's a theoretical benefit. Uh, I think over time, um, some of the benefits are less than they used to be because uh, advances in, in bone marrow transplant technology, including uh, from the person themselves using their own bone marrow that's been modified and giving it back to them, and also from unrelated or living related donors, those technologies are advancing. And so the use of cord blood for bone marrow, uh, for uh, transplants, um, that's becoming less of a need, but I wouldn't say it's of zero potential use in the future for every person. So I can't say that it's of, 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 uh, of no value. I would say it's of theoretical value and maybe diminishing value, but potentially it could be useful. But buried in the question is whether or not the, D, the blood could be used for DNA analysis. And uh, I don't think it would be necessary for that purpose, for, to, to determine if the child were affected and so forth. I would say that, that would, not be, would not serve that purpose. You can just do, draw blood from the individual now and, and get the information you need. You would need to store cord blood for that purpose. But for potential transplant, it's a, it's a theoretical use in the future and that uh, value of that is declining. What are your thoughts on bilateral femoral rotation and tendon loosening for a young adult who has uh, reached the end of their growth? Well, uh, certainly surgery recommendations in hereditary spastic paraplegia or in primary lateral sclerosis have to be individualized. One recommendation, and they have to be considered very carefully and made only for that individual and for that limb. So uh, the procedure has to be individualized for the person and the specific um, problem and the specific outcome that is uh, desired. So uh, I can't make a, a, a generalization except to say, one, get a second opinion. Two, um, wait until after the growth spurt, after, you know, which is, uh, in your question, that has been a, a, a reached. And three, um, we, we have to figure out what the problem is that we're trying to overcome. If it's tightness in the muscle, can that tightness be reduced by uh, direct injection of Botox? Has that been explored? Has it been explored adequately? What was the result of Botox? Um, is the problem pain? Can pain be reduced by orthotics, something inserted into the shoe or a brace on the leg? Uh, is there another way, either through bracing or orthotics or through Botox, that can change the position of the foot and the knee um, to accomplish those objectives? How thoroughly have they been explored? Uh, and uh, someone said, well, we tried Botox and it didn't do anything. Well, what was the outcome of Botox? Uh, did it actually have a muscle relaxing effect? Uh, or do you need to try it again at a bigger dose in a different set of muscles, uh, so forth? However, having gone through all of these, some t there, is a, there is a place for some individuals in which surgery has been beneficial. We have to be very careful about this in, in selecting the procedure, selecting the surgeon, and selecting which, uh, which individuals are gonna have this procedure. Be very careful in selecting it. Uh, one thing that surgery can do is that it can change the way the foot hits the floor. It does not necessarily, it would not be predicted to change the agility in moving the foot. 
or the knee. It can change the way, instead of walking on the outside of the foot or walking on the toes, it could give you a more of a flat foot strike. But it would not be predicted to increase the strength or the agility, the dexterity, the precision of those movements. It would affect the platform in which the foot hits the floor. And sometimes that's a major issue. And sometimes that needs to be fixed. And sometimes other issues are, are more important. So yes, surgery, orthopedic surgery has a place. Now, I can't speak to the, the, the question about rotation that you asked about femoral head rotation. That would be on a per person uh, uh, basis. We'd have to look at the result at that person in, uh, you know, uh, in the clinic and look at their x-rays and so forth. This person says they were first diagnosed as spinal cerebellar ataxia and has been getting an MRI of the cerebellum every two years. Uh, the question is, instead, should they be getting an MRI of the spine? Spinal, cere spinal cerebellar ataxia and hereditary spastic paraplegia, these are cousins. And uh, it's a, sometimes there's uh, a blurring of the lines between these. There are some forms of spinal, cerebe spinal cerebellar ataxia that are, for all the world, forms of hereditary spastic paraplegia. And in some, sometimes they, we say, this person has a spastic ataxia. Other times we say this person has an ataxia with spasticity. So it's a, it can be a degree to which the cerebellum is involved. So spinal cerebellar ataxia is like, for example, SPG7, one of the most common forms of HSP, one of the most common recessive forms of HSP, uh, commonly has cerebellar involvement. And so in that case, SPG7 is a form of HSP, recessively inherited form of HSP, often associated with ataxia. And so that would be an example of a person that would fit in two camps. They could be in a, in an HSP with ataxia or a spinal cerebellar syndrome with spasticity. Now, the issue is about, the question is about uh, whether they need serial monitoring by MRI scan. And I don't know that they need serial monitoring. I can't answer this on a, on a specific basis for an individual. Uh, but in general, um, what are we going to do with that information? We might see at the, the, the value of imaging is to exclude other conditions. Uh, so, but once we've, once we've excluded other conditions and made a diagnosis, then why are we going to do serial imaging? Unless we're doing it for a research purpose, or unless the condition changes, and now we want to rethink the diagnosis. Or if, there's a, if some other symptom occurs and we need to, to look for an explanation of that other symptom. But I, I don't routinely do serial imaging of the spinal cord on an every year, every two year basis just to look. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't do that. And so I don't know that if the person was thought to have spinal cerebellar ataxia and now their diagnosis is having hereditary spastic paraplegia, that they would need, therefore, to have serial monitoring. I don't know that I would do that. Someone who is apparently taking baclofen uh, talks about the side effects and their sensitivity to it and asks, is there a better drug given that than baclofen that they might be able to take? Uh, baclofen um, is not vitamin B. There are better vitamin Bs, but baclofen uh, is helpful for some people. It is, uh, oral baclofen is very rarely uh, tremendously beneficial. Usually it just helps somewhat. And so if it helps somewhat, we try more. Eventually, people have side effects. And the side effects are common because we keep, we say, well, if it's helping, at 30 milligrams, let's go to 40 milligrams. If it's helping at 40 milligrams, let's slowly work our way to 60 or 80 or more. But eventually, people have side effects. And so the side effects are sometimes very obvious. They're just so tired. Sometimes it causes uh, impaired thinking. Sometimes it causes uh, memory problems. Or um, besides memory problems, sometimes it causes uh, depression. Now, if you're tired, that's obvious. 
But it might not be obvious that a person has sunk into depression. And that might not be obvious that it's from the baclofen itself. We have to be careful about memory and fatigue and depression and irritability and judgment. We certainly have to be uh, worried or concerned about uh, constipation and weakness and difficulty urinating. Baclofen can have a lot of side effects. Reversible when you reduce the dose or, or stop it. The question is, is there something better? Well, uh, there's the concept of uh, baclofen pumps or intrathecal baclofen that does not have some of these cognitive or emotional side effects, uh, but we'll leave that question aside for now. Uh, there's Botox. Botox injections are helpful when the spasticity is in a particular group of muscles. So, if the main problem walking is tightness in the ankles, well, I would go for Botox into the calves to treat that, uh, to try to target selected muscles. Or if it's the inner thigh muscles, bringing the knees together. If they're particularly tight, I would try Botox there rather than large doses of uh, baclofen. Now, another medicine that's often used is uh, Tizanidine or Xanaflex. And uh, I haven't met a person who can take Xanaflex and not be tired. Xanaflex is, in general terms, uh, very, uh, maybe there are people, but it's very commonly sedating. And uh, so uh, uh, we can't use the doses of Xanaflex that we can with Baclofen because Baclofen is also sedating, but less sedating than, than uh, Xanaflex or Tizanidine. Another medicine that uh, we use uh, uh, sometimes is Dantrium or Dantrolene. And Dantrium is a muscle relaxant that works more directly on the muscles themselves. Uh, it does not have the uh, side effects of sedation or any memory problems. So, but the problem with Dantrium is that at high doses, it has caused very serious liver disease. And so uh, uh, it, it is a, 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 an effective old school medicine for muscle to cause, uh, uh, to treat muscle spasticity. But at high doses, it has caused very severe liver disease. And so it, we do use it. I use it, I've used it for 30 years. Uh, and I, use it, I have, uh, thankfully, not had problems with it. However, we check the liver enzymes before prescribing uh, Dantrium. We check the liver enzymes every two weeks for the first few months, then every four weeks, then every 12 weeks. We're checking liver every eight to 12 weeks for the duration of the use of the, of the medicine. We check the liver again anytime any new medicine is, is, is uh, started because maybe there's a combined effect that would affect the liver. And we, I don't go to the high doses of Dantrium. Above 400 milligrams, people have had side effects. I only go to 300. I try to stay at 200. So I'm not getting the full benefit from Dantrium, but I think I can use it safely long term at monitoring and lower doses. And uh, so but we have a Baclofen, Xanaflex, Botox, Dantrium. People have talked about uh, uh, CBD and uh, uh, medical marijuana for spasticity, and uh, but it has shown benefit. And uh, in general terms, um, I think its degree of benefit is somewhat less than Baclofen. It, it does have benefit. But I, I would say baclofen is a more powerful medicine than uh, medical marijuana. And, uh, um, but there are, I've seen results, not in my patients, but in other, other clinicians' patients um, that have shown benefit. And it can be an adjunctive medicine for some people. A couple of different questions about uh, circumstances where HSD patients uh, 
what fear, stress, nervousness, asking how does that affect uh, their mobility issues and how often do you see that? Uh, well, uh, um, uh, spasticity is a very dynamic feature. Muscle tightness is very dynamic, meaning uh, it's changeable throughout the day, throughout the week, depending on how much sleep you got, how rested you are, uh, how uh, anxious a person is, how relaxed they are, how fatigued they are, whether they're in pain. It changes all the time, all these factors. Um, if a person is anxious, definitely worsens their spasticity. Uh, and uh, if a person, sometimes, uh, if a person's in pain, their spasticity will be worse. So if they have back pain, that can worsen their spasticity. If they're not sleeping at night, their spasticity can be worse. Uh, so stress, lack of sleep, pain, uh, anxiety, all of these things worsen spasticity. And I didn't mention one that's so common, and that is uh, cold. Cold temperature can worsen spasticity. So spasticity I would say it's uni universal. You said how common, the question is how commonly or how often do we see emotional factors or stress or fatigue or anger or uh, so forth, do they, uh, or sadness, do they worsen spasticity and it's in every person. Doctor, do you have any particular dietary recommendations that might make uh, someone living with PLS or HSP better? I about the diet and nutritional treatments, I don't have recommendations for HSP and PLS. And uh, this is something where, where we, need to, we need to learn more about this. In general terms, we would say, I would say uh, a well-balanced diet that uh, with uh, plenty of vitamins naturally occurring in the foods, diverse foods, uh, just a well-balanced, healthy diet. I don't have, and I would also think it's reasonable to take, to, to have a diet that's rich in antioxidant vitamins. And sometimes we would even supplement that with, uh, with, with the antioxidant vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin E, sometimes taking coenzyme Q10. These are of unproven value. So I, I, I want to be very careful to say that I don't have a recommendation that they will help, but it's reasonable to use, uh, to have a diet that's rich in antioxidants and maybe even take uh, vitamin supplements of, of uh, vitamin uh, E and coenzyme Q10 uh, at not mega dose and vitamin C, not mega dose, but just uh, one, once a day uh, because one of the factors that affects axon degeneration, one of many factors that affect the nerve degeneration, is uh, oxidative damage. And it, it's a stretch to say, or a leap to say, taking more of these supplements would stop or reduce that. I don't know that, as, I don't know that at all, scientifically. But uh, in general terms, for individuals with uh, degenerative conditions of all kinds. Uh, people have recommended antioxidants and sometimes supplements with, uh, with these vitamins. Does bowel incontinence affect everyone with HSP and does it come on gradually or all of a sudden? Uh, bowel incontinence is not common in HSP. Um, urinary urgency is almost universal. Occasionally, it's the first symptom, but uh, uh, the uh, uh, difficulty controlling the urge to urinate is extremely common. Sometimes, but much less frequently, difficulty controlling the urge to defecate, to have a bowel movement, that can, be, that can occur in HSP and PLS as well. But, um, Incontinence is uh, bowel incontinence. That's a uh, th that needs to be um, investigated more specifically. Spe uh, what I mean is, 
is, if it's diarrhea, well, uh, diarrhea can make bowel urgency um, worse, to, more difficult to contain. So if a person is having bowel urgency, which could occur, not commonly, but which could occur with, with HSP and PLS, and then they have loose stools, well now that's a, that's a, that's a, there are two factors that affect bowel continence. Diarrhea or loose stools is usually not a feature of HSP and PLS. So bowel urgency can be a feature of HSP and PLS. Not commonly, but can be. But the consistency of the stool is usually not, a fact, not affected. That is, diarrhea or loose stools is usually not affected in HSP and PLS. So my answer is this. If someone says they have bowel urgency, when they have to have a bowel movement, they have to go right now. That could be part of HSP or PLS. However, if they talk about having um, eight or 10 stools a day of loose consistency, I would think we have a gastrointestinal motility issue or a dietary content issue and they should see a gastroenterologist. Can or should a person with HSP be an organ donor? People with HSP and PLS can certainly be organ donors. This condition is not transmitted. Neither, none of these conditions, HSP and PLS, certainly not transmitted um, uh, through organ donation. Are there any alternative treatments uh, that have been successful uh, in helping uh, such as acupuncture? Oh, absolutely. Acupuncture has uh, definitely shown benefit in reducing pain and in some experienced hands in uh, reducing spasticity. The uh, issue with, with acupuncture, like the issue with all therapies, is you have to find um, some, it has to be uh, individualized for the person and, uh, and in the case of acupuncture, done by an experienced provider. And, uh, but there are certainly, uh, there are reports of benefit from, in terms of spasticity reduction, in some but not all people uh, with acupuncture. So acupuncture would be one therapy, like all therapies, that help some people and don't help other people and help some of the symptoms in some people specifically and don't treat other symptoms and, and, and so forth. So yeah, acupuncture is, has, is, uh, is sometimes useful. Two questions about uh, stem cell therapy, and let me read them both and maybe you can uh, deal with both. What is the current success and availability of stem cell therapy for HSP? And then a specific, my younger sister who also has SPG4 received stem cell therapy less than a month ago it was inhaled. One day shortly after all her symptoms disappeared, but returned the next day. What are the chances of them disappearing for a much longer period of time, and what are the dangers? Um, stem cell therapy in HSP is uh, at the research level. It uh, certainly not at the therapeutic level, at the clinically proven value and clinically available level. It's a concept that's being explored in research settings. So the availability, these are our stem cells. Now, one thing that is available uh, in various parts of the world are um, operators and institutions that are offering sham therapies and that are not stem cells and uh, there are offshore corporations and, and so forth uh, that are not licensed in the United States that people can, who are very uh, vulnerable to these sham, um, uh, non-therapeutic, uh, um, what is being touted as stem cells but really aren't stem cells. Uh, there are people that are vulnerable to this and uh, and so we have to be very careful about that. But in the United States, um, and in, in uh, Europe, Asia, so forth, 
uh, this use of stem cells in HSP is being, and in ALS specifically, is being explored. And uh, it, it, these are at the research level, not at the clinic, not, uh, not of demonstrated clinical utility, and, uh, and maybe they'll help some symptoms, maybe they'll help, uh, but, but they're not ready yet. Um, now, uh, the other question is about uh, the transient benefit of inhaled stem cells. I would have to just, um, I, I'm not sure what they're referring to, and I'm, I'm very skeptical of that. Does HSP affect one sex more than the other? Um, HSP, there are many different types of HSP. And there are more than 90 types of HSP. And uh, s occasionally, HSP is X-linked. That's not the most common. In general, X-linked forms of HSP are not that common, with the exception of, a, of a adrenal myeloneuropathy, AMN, adrenal myeloneuropathy, which is technically a form of HSP, and uh, which is a fairly common rare disorder. Uh, but X-linked conditions, adrenal myeloneuropathy, AMN, and its other form, adrenal leukodystrophy, and there are, there's SPG1, I'm sorry, SPG2, rather, uh, HSP. There are several forms of HSP that are X-linked. These are, in general, rare forms. The X-linked forms occur mainly in males. With that exception, uh, both sexes are affected for all the other types of HSP. So with, that, with those exceptions of X-linked forms, all the other types of HSP affect both sexes. There can be differences in the in the degree of symptoms between males and females. Uh, but in general, HSP affects, with the exception of the X-linked forms, uh, which are, affect mainly males, HSP affects males and females. Dr. Fan, we've got time for one more question. Uh, this person says, I've had HSP symptoms since birth. Never had testing for specific, specific mutation and has remained uh, highly functional. Is it likely that I will remain so? Uh, lower symptoms for life, how can I be sure? Okay, the question is about, uh, the general question is about predicting the course of HSP for an individual. A person has symptoms with HSP, what's likely to happen in the next five years? And uh, this is something that uh, that uh, people have struggled with, and the, the way I would respond is that predictions of the future, of the course, the prognosis, are not based on the name of the condition. So I do not, as a clinician, make a prognosis based on the results of genetic testing or the name of the syndrome. I do not make a prediction on, based on that. I make a prediction only, and, and I don't make a prediction based on what the symptom, how it's progressed in a family member. Uh, well, the father had symptoms like this, began at this age, and by this age he was in a wheelchair, so your symptoms began at this age, and so uh, you're about to age, so we predict based on what your father had. I do not do that. I don't make predictions based on the name of the condition or the name of the gene or how the condition has appeared in a family member, whether that family member is a sibling or a child or a parent. I, I don't make those predictions based on the, the course of anybody in the family or the name of the gene. I make predictions only based on the demonstrated pattern in that individual. So, if a person has uh, childhood onset symptoms, in your question, childhood onset symptoms, and for 10 years the symptoms haven't changed. Well, I would predict that for the, for the future, they would remain stable. Now, more specifically, we say 
What has happened in the past year? What has happened in the past two years? They say, well, I'm doing the same things I've been doing for, for the past couple of years. We'd say, well, then we want to predict for the next couple of years, we're not going to predict a change. Why would we predict a change? And then people would say, well, because I read that people that have this gene mutation, they get worse. The people that get worse are people that are getting worse. The people that are stable are not getting worse. So we make predictions based on the demonstrated pattern in that individual, and that's all we make predictions on, all I ever make predictions on. In, in, the, in the question you asked, this person for, their, for, more than, for several decades has not had a change in their symptoms. Well, I would predict that would continue. I would predict 30 years of non-progressive symptoms will remain non-progressive with one exception. Tightness, that is spasticity, if it's untreated, will get worse. And sometimes even if it's treated, it gets worse. So the condition might not change, but the symptom of spasticity can be relentless. So if a person has tightness in their legs and they don't actively stretch or actively work with, must, with medications or to, to uh, uh, to get full range of motion, those legs can get tighter and tighter and tighter, and especially for childhood onset conditions, they can be associated with contractures. Now, contractures are tendon shortening, it's not muscle tightness. And tendon shortening uh, is not overcome by muscle relaxing medicine, because the tendons are now shorter. So, the point is, is that the condition might not change, but spasticity can be relentless. And so advancing spasticity can worsen uh, walking ability. So the condition could be stable, that's wonderful, but all effort needs to be directed at keeping full range of motion and keeping the spasticity at bay, and making sure that that symptom of the condition doesn't advance. Dr. Fink, once again, we appreciate your work with the foundation and your time here to answer some questions. Happy to do it. We will see you again. Okay, thank you very much.